1974, six years after the Soviet K-129 submarine was lost, a ship by the name of Hughes Glomar Explorer, with the intention of mining, would execute one of the largest secret missions in the history of the CIA. Known today as the Project Azorian, this mission required long years of planning to recover the one thing that the U.S. didn't have at the time. The K-129 submarine was launched in 1959, and after many upgrades throughout the 1960s, it carried one of the Soviet Union's newest weapons, three R-21 nuclear-tipped submarine-launched ballistic missiles. The R-21s were the first missiles that Soviet submarines could launch while submerged. In 1968, in the middle of the Cold War, the submarine went on a routine combat patrol in a remote area carrying three ballistic nuclear missiles and 98 crew members. However, the submarine vanished, and after days of no radio communication, the Soviet Union launched a major search operation to locate and recover the sunken submarine. It was important for them to recover since it contained the latest cryptography gear, sonar systems, and other military technology. If they were in the wrong hands, it could result in other countries figuring out some of the Soviet secrets. The Soviet Union began their search with 36 vessels searching over a million square miles of the Pacific Ocean, joined by 53 aircraft that flew over 286 flights for over two months. After months of searching, they weren't able to find it, and they called off the search and declared that the submarine was lost. At this time, the United States was watching the entire thing closely, looking for a way to find the submarine without the Soviet Union knowing. After the Soviet search was over, the U.S. started its search. At this point, the U.S. had something that the Soviet Union didn't, and that was the Sound Surveillance System, or the SOSIS, which is a network of underwater listening devices built to detect submarines. They dispatched the USS Halibut to locate the wreck. The Halibut was outfitted with the latest technology and tools to survive the deep ocean. It turned into one of the most secret weapons in the American undersea intelligence arsenal. After only two weeks of searching, they located the K-129 submarine 1,500 miles northwest of Hawaii. It was sitting 16,500 feet below the surface and in almost perfect shape. So the U.S. decided to recover it. This is where Project Azorian comes into action. Having located the lost submarine, the CIA then got approval from President Richard Nixon and the project was handed to the CIA. Nothing had previously been recovered from such a depth, let alone a submarine weighing around 2,000 tons. The CIA knew they had to do it in complete secrecy and determined how they were going to accomplish the task. It sounded impossible as they would have to build a recovery system to salvage the submarine. Still, the CIA's Directorate of Science and Technology was eager to give it a shot, so the project began. That's why they smashed that like button, just like you should if you haven't done so already. But no, in all seriousness, the project was handed to John Parangoski, a program manager at the CIA. He handpicked the best scientists and engineers and set them up in a secret satellite office outside of Washington nicknamed the Think Tank, where they would debate proposals on how to execute the mission. Ultimately, then landed on something called Grunt Lift. They came up with the idea to build a ship with a device coming out of the hole that would be able to lift the submarine and pull it to the surface. The odds of success were less than 10%, but they weren't about to quit since they were eager to get their hands on the technology that the U.S. didn't have. The Soviet Union at the time began to suspect that the U.S. was up to something, so for the CIA, it wouldn't be easy to recover the submarine with the Soviet Union watching. Even though they kept the entire project classified, there was always the threat that it could be revealed to the Soviet Union. The project would take six years, cost hundreds of millions, and involve thousands of people. So to avoid suspicion, the CIA needed to come up with a cover story bigger than the project itself. The CIA came up with a brilliant cover story to remove public attention. The team would tell the world that their ship was a mining ship designed to pluck manganese nodules from the seafloor, which contained rare minerals. Someone had to own that ship for this to work, and it couldn't be the CIA. This is where Howard R. Hughes comes into the project. Hughes was an American business person and was the perfect frontman for the role. He was rich and eccentric and had a background in mining. Also, he had a track of doing things that didn't make sense, such as the Spruce Goose, and a history of supporting government projects, including a few for the CIA. At that time, Hughes hadn't been seen in public for years, as he lived in isolation at the top floor of his Las Vegas casino. But he instantly agreed to be the frontman for Project Azorian. With the Hughes Tool Company serving as a front for the project, 
the CIA hired experts to write scientific papers for mining and shipping publications. The public, as well as the Soviet Union, bought the story. The construction of the ship began and was unlike any ship ever built. Everything had to be custom designed and built from scratch. The ship was named the Hughes Glomar Explorer, and it had a hull with huge doors that could open and swallow the K-29 without anyone noticing. On deck, there was a dark room, a decontamination room, an area for drying and preserving documents, and a refrigerated morgue for storing human remains found on the submarine. The ship ended up being too wide to pass through the Panama Canal, so it had to sail around South America before it could begin its mission. The Explorer was set to sail. However, the ship was being watched by the Soviet Union, who sent two ships and helicopters to monitor the Explorer. After some time surveying the Explorer, the Soviet Union didn't believe that anything suspicious was happening, and the Explorer continued with its mission. After being launched in 1974, the ship spent a month lowering the claw that would grab the submarine. Finally, the claw reached the ocean floor, and over the next week, it slowly brought the submarine to the surface. A few days into the recovery, an unexpected disaster struck. Midway up, several of the claw's fingers snapped, and a large part of the submarine slipped back onto the seafloor. The large piece that snapped and fell to the bottom of the ocean included the portion with the missile silos and the code room. The CIA director ordered the explorer to make another attempt, but was told that it was impossible since the claw was broken. If they were to try again, it'd have to be the next year. In the recovered section, there were two nuclear torpedoes, code books, and other materials. However, not much more is known about what else was recovered as most documents are still classified today. In the recovered section, there were the remains of six crewmen, and because of radioactivity, all were given military service and buried at sea in metal caskets. Since they weren't able to recover the entire submarine in the first mission, the CIA went back the next year to recover what was left. They set plans for a second recovery effort called Project Matador, where they would make repairs and improvements to the ship for this follow-up mission and return to recover everything. However, this project didn't go as planned, since in 1975, reporter Jack Anderson broke the story about Project Azorian. The project was leaked and their cover was blown, and soon after, the Soviet and the American public knew all about the top-secret mission to recover the K-129. With the CIA's cover blown, the White House canceled the second mission and the Soviet Navy began to closely monitor the ocean around the wreck. So Russia's found a new way to smash that subscribe button and ring that notification bell. But no, in all seriousness, so was the operation a success? Well, it had remained a secret for five years, and the CIA never fully disclosed what they recovered, but it's believed that the recovery included at least two nuclear-tipped torpedoes and a collection of documents. The recovered section also included an insight into the Soviet submarine design, such as where important pieces were manufactured and how often they were replaced. The U.S. government refused to acknowledge or deny the project using the words, can neither confirm nor deny. All in all, this project resulted in a successful operation, even though it didn't reach all its goals. The good thing that came out of this project was that the CIA brought up the corpses of the dead Russian soldiers who received a proper burial, which was a noble gesture by the CIA. The technology that was developed to salvage the K-129 led to the creation of the deep sea mining industry. The positioning technology that kept the Glomar Explorer stable and positioned over a specific point became standard practice in offshore oil drilling. It was a daring mission during the Cold War, and to this day is still talked about. It proved how far the U.S. were willing to go to uncover the technologies they were lacking. This heist definitely goes down in history, and the Glomar Express is probably the greatest technical achievement in ocean engineering. To this day, some parts of this operation remain classified. We may never know exactly what happened, but we can say with confidence that the CIA executed the perfect secret mission with the best cover-up story in history. Bye for now.